Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Chris Rowe, who's back in Kansas after spending a good portion of September in Arizona. And Chris, I want to do a little wrap-up with you on elk season, get some of your takeaways uh, on things that you learned uh, this season. But first of all, how are you doing? <laughs> doing well, yeah. I, I just got back last night and uh, – Tried to, this is always the tough, every time we get these transitions between, you know, big blocks of hunting, you know, you, you deal with the same thing with turkeys, you know, you mobilize, well, for, for uh, coos deer and turkeys as well, you kind of, you spend a month doing one thing and then all of a sudden the season ends and you just kind of, I don't know, I just kind of sit there like for a day <laughs> you or You stumble two. around. <laughs> yeah, I just, just don't know what to do. wander around like, wondering uh, what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's like I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm like completely not in my routine anymore and now i've got to kind of re retool so yeah the truck hasn't even been unloaded the camper's still a shamble so i've got yeah i've got some stuff to do but it's good to be home it's good to be home that's good um we're going to dive into some of the things you learned this elk season uh but it sounds like uh from years past usually once you make the transition you very quickly jump into chasing white tails there in kansas right Oh, yeah, no, that's exactly it. As soon as I get everything buttoned up, uh, like, within a day, I need, you know, the rest of the day, I need to get everything buttoned up, wrapped up from elk, and then I'm just literally unhooking the camper, hooking up the flatbed trailer, loading up the Ranger and the, the Genesis 3 Cedar, and I've got to put, I've got to finish up putting some food plots in and get some tree stands up, cameras out. It's just, I mean, it doesn't even, uh, it doesn't even wait. It's just one right into the next, so, yeah. I noticed this summer you did quite a bit of um, work on your property and um, planning and what have you. D did you have plots that, you know, has Kelly been able to tell you if, if they're looking good or where are you at in that process? Yeah, yeah, no, I, um, you're right. I had a couple of, uh, several of them that I planted prior to me leaving. I've got feedback from one landowner that things are looking really good. They've been getting decent uh, moisture. Looking at what I planted on my personal property, uh, they came up really, really good, except, boy, we are dry. I mean, we're dry, dry. So the vegetation is looking a little stressed. As far as the other, I've got some other food plots that are a really nice, diverse, but there's about a five-species blend of cool season. I have not been down there to take a look to see how they are doing. I know they came up well just whether or not we've got some heat stress on them right now, I don't know. We got a little bit of rain this morning, but I don't think it's enough to, to really give anything a drink. I think it's one of those kind of little little tiny passing rains that makes everything wet on the surface, but that's about it. But, yeah, so it looks like it had a good initial growth. The question is going to be how much, how much drought stress are we on it now, and will we see a change in the weather pattern to really kick it in gear? I don't know if I'm going to have to replant some stuff or not. I don't know. Gotcha. Um, okay, let's dive into uh, elk season. We've already talked about your Colorado, and you touched uh, somewhat on some of the things in Arizona Unit 9, but in a general sense, what was your overall thought of Arizona Unit 9 this year uh, compared to other years when you've been there? What were some of the things that jump out at you? Uh, the biggest one is I have never in my, it, you know, obviously I've not been down there as much as, you, you know, for the years that you guys have. However, um, folks that have hunted that for 40 years said the same thing. I have never seen this many two-and-a-half and maybe three-and-a-half-year-old bulls in that unit in my life. They were everywhere. That's, I mean... When, when you, you know, people always talk about the fact that you've got to wade through bulls, you know, those satellite bulls, those younger age class bulls to get to the herd bulls. That's absolutely the case in, in a lot of these um, more, what would you, you know, kind of, kind of quote unquote trophy managed units where you've got a high bull to cow ratio where you have a diverse age structure of your bulls. That, that's, that's pretty typical. However, you usually have one of those situations where yeah, you'll have some spikes, you'll have some raghorns, you'll have some small branch antler, and then you've got your 300 class, you know, maybe you got your three- and four-year-old bulls, and then maybe you got your five-year-old bulls, and then now we start getting an older age class and some of those, you know, the herd bulls. Well, you know, we've been taught, Jay, you and I have been talking about it, and I know other people have been talking about it, but 
Yes, does Unit 9 have a handful of big mature bulls? Yes, they do. But that is not the same unit, brother. I'm telling you, it just it's the number of two-and-a-half and three-and-a-half-year-old and three bulls in there. That's literally all. I mean, it was like the unit was 90% two-and-a-half to three-and-a-half-year-old bulls, five to six percent your uh, four, five, and six-year-old bulls, and that, well, no, not even more than that, because, I mean, maybe a bull that was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, you know, a mature bull, I think that was probably one percent or less. Um, it was, it was incredible. You'd get on, you'd, you'd finally, and it was quiet, and I mean, we can talk about the, you know, reason why it was quiet, but when you finally got on bulls, and you looked at who was who was there, and we've talked about this before. When you change the age structure and you change that dynamic, um, it, it's it is switched. I I truly believe we're in a situation now where yes, you'll find you know one big one big mature bull, and he'll come in, and yeah, he'll have fifteen twenty cows, but that's an anomaly. It, this year it seemed like that was m uh, even more of an anomaly than what it was last year. Most of the time. You're dealing with a younger age class bull, and he's got two cows. I I watch cat, I watch bulls that were day in and day out locked down with one cow and a calf. That was that was it. That bull was locked down that with one cow and a calf, and for days that's all he was. Would he you know he'd be on, or you'd get in another bull and he's got two cows, a yearling cat, you know, a yearling cow, and then maybe a calf in the mix. And I mean, he's happy as all get out that he's got his little group of girls. But uh, it was it was another tough season. You know, we obviously had drought stress, and, and there was, you know, antler quality was down because of all that, blah, blah, blah. But age class, age class was what really shocked me on, on just the numbers of baby bulls, so what I would call a baby, you know, the, that two-and-a-half to three-and-a-half-year-old bull. Um, it was crazy. It was crazy. So, so the, the conditions, the grass and stuff really came on with the monsoon. It sounds like antler growth was down, but it sounds like you've got a lot of young bulls. It seemed like before, you know, I, I've been seeing it the last few years that I was there, just keeps, in my opinion, I would say not from a biological standpoint or looking at it like, you know, a scientist would. I would just be looking at it like an elk hunter, and I would say it's the, the unit has been declining steadily, meaning where it used to be you'd see a 350 class bull every single day. I'm not talking age, I'm talking size of, of antler, but yeah, you would see that, you know, a 350 every single day. It was almost cookie cutter, like six by six, you know, just beautiful yes. 345, 350 type bull, and it seems like the last few years that I've been in there, those have been getting less and less and less, um, and in your opinion, can you put your finger on what has created the, you know, two, three-year-old bulls just everywhere? Well, I, I think we've got a couple things going on. And, and, you know, our friend, we've got a mutual friend that I think you're with right now that, that lives out there. And uh, he's got some good insight because he ends up flying. Uh, he does a lot of flying in the region, not from a hunting standpoint, but, but for his job, it puts him in the air a lot, traveling to and from different places around that region in, in Arizona. And so when you said the monsoons really help the rains, yes. Um, I think in certain areas of the unit, the rain, the monsoon definitely helped. Now you could go, you know, you'd go in some pockets of the unit and you'd look and I mean the grass is it's just crispy fried. It's maybe one inch tall, didn't even go to seed. And it's just, it's burnt. It's, it's just dirt. It looks like crap. But then you go to another area, you might drive 30 minutes to another portion of the unit, which anybody that drives out there, I mean, the roads, some of the roads are bad to where, I mean, 30 minutes is not that far technically. You know, I mean, you, you can drive just a little ways in a different spot of the unit, and all of a sudden the grass is, I mean, it just looks like a completely different world. It's a green carpet of grass, and, you know, maybe here the grass is, say, you know, six, eight inches tall, and it's actually starting to go to seed, and it's it's pockets, and, and there's good water. But then you get into, you know, you get up into some a little bit higher elevation, you get some of the pines and stuff like that, and you walk in there and you're, oh, my word. I mean, the, the grass is knee-high. It's just thick. It's green. It's lush. It's beautiful. 
And then you go right over the hill, and it's like, wait a minute, what, what happened? We, we just, where's our grass? It just, all of a sudden now, it's, boom, it's back to brown. Um, so the monsoons helped, but the problem with monsoons, like we've, I think we've talked about before, is it, it can rain three inches on this end of the mountain and not get a drop on the other end of the mountain. And if that one end of the mountain repeatedly gets rain, well, where do you think the elk are going to go? And in the case of nine, I think um, there may, and I don't know this, um, other than from what I saw driving back and forth between uh, Grand Canyon and, and Flagstaff, and then from what uh, you know, our friends have, have said, I think you see a lot of better forage in places like Seven West or, or down towards Flagstaff and then maybe even over on the Navajo Indian Reservation to where part of the issue that we may have had in nine this year is just the elk went where the where the rain was falling and they just picked up and moved and they yeah. just didn't come back in. And that may be why we see so many younger age class bulls. Maybe those younger age class bulls have just been bumped out of neighboring areas. And so they're like, well, that's, you know, unit nine ended up being the place where they all just piled in too. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, the nursery. Yeah. But, you know, you still have a high number of rifle tags each year, um, you know, late, late season tags. Um, and then, you know, you had a, it, it was just, I don't know, the, the conditions over the past 365 days, I don't think were conducive to really, I, again, I'm not talking about, you know, antler quality because we know that we were, you know, 20 to 30 inches down on antler quality this year. But from a, from a, a elk home range, you know, utilization of habitat and where they're going to go, I just don't know if, if nine had the conditions this year to really bring those mature bulls back. I think a lot of them left. I, we didn't get into a lot of cows at all. I mean, there was just pockets of cow calves you normally and jay you know this too up on grand canyon normally you can drive through the park and it's just it's just screaming they're they're going crazy there's large groups of cows you'll have a big bur big bull running 20 30 cows in the park and then just go down the road a little bit here's another big bull 20 30 cows. that was not the case that i mean literally the park was crickets now arizona fishing game was fixing a couple of key water sources in a couple of, you know, you know you, you, you know from the unit, there's a couple key areas in the unit that are always year in and year out, you know, kind of ground zero of where there's going to be an elk activity area. Well, Arizona Fishing Game was in there. They tore out the water sources. They were do, doing work in there. So that obviously is going to kick some elk out of those places. Um, but... I, I think the habitat-wise, it just wasn't conducive to just keep some of those elk in that unit um, like we normally see. But it was it was definitely an interesting year. This year was a little bit different for you. Um, you actually had someone with a crossbow permit. Uh, talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about uh, how your strategy and setup changed or were the same or, or anything that you noticed between a traditional archery and, and crossbow? Well, yeah, I, I, and maybe we maybe we expand that conversation into a longer discussion later, but uh, unless you want to dive into it, because I, I had my eyes open. I was, had, long story short, I had, I was heavily involved in Colorado politics, sportsman politics back when I lived there, and, and the crossbow issue in archery season always came up. You know, everybody, not everybody, there's a lot of people that don't like, a lot of archery hunters that do not like the idea of a crossbow being illegal in an arch, an early archery season. Back east, you know, even where I'm in Kansas, it was very controversial. There was a lot of people that were upset about it. But when we're dealing with whitetails, sometimes it just doesn't matter how you kill them. You just need to kill more deer. You know, sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes. And that's why sometimes the legislature's like, listen, you know, if you want to use an atlatl or a slingshot, we don't care. Just go kill the things. We need, we need to have the harvest. But when, and, it, and, you know, for home recruitment and getting new people involved in the sport, there's all sorts of arguments for it. But when you go out west and um, you look at some, how some of the western game management is and, and harvest and all that, 
you know, there's an argument that no, we don't need to increase harvest in some areas, and you know, the argument was that that crossbows were going to give an unfair advantage and increased harvest, blah 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 blah. I will tell you right now, I, that was the most pain in the butt, worthless piece of crap thing that I ever had. I mean, that I've ever seen in, in my hunter. The, the reason why my hunter had a crossbow this year is because his shoulders. It are literally, he's, for his life's sake, he's a retired firefighter. He did a lot of sports when he was younger, so his shoulders are, are basically bone on bone anymore. He doesn't have any cartilage in between the joints, and so he just physically, uh, medical uh, permit, he just no longer has the ability to shoot his compound. That's all he's ever done. He's hunted archery his entire life, and this was the first year he could not physically get you know, use his compound bow. He was he was devastated, but that's why he was like, you know what? I'm just going to get the crossbow permit just so I can utilize this this tag. Well, even he would say, "What a clunky pain in the butt!" Crossbow you mean mechanically, are. like like all the, the ones he had, or just all of them? All of the above. Now I've got experience with crossbows out here in Kansas, but most of the time, you know, you're walking you say a couple hundred yards from where you where you parked and most of the time my crossbow experience in Kansas is doe hunts late season and so we literally you park the truck you get the crossbow out you walk a couple hundred yards across the field you sit in the ground blind and and you literally have you know your shooting sticks or whatever in the ground blind and the crossbow sits leaned up against the wall of the blind you're at the truck you 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 cock it or whatever it's not a big deal when you start talking about an elk hunt, a dynamic, you're chasing, trying to chase bugles style elk hunt, oh my gosh, from cocking, he had a state-of-the-art crossbow. He had one of the, I mean, whoop de woo expensive, very nice crossbow setups. No joke about it. It was the top-of-the-line crossbow setup. It's still, I mean, from trying to carry the thing, um, in a manner that, I mean, you, you, have, you got it on your sling, but you got your backpack, the thing is heavy, it's awkward, it doesn't want to sit on your shoulder like a rifle does. I mean, to cocking it to where this is one where you're not going to just grab the string and, and, and pull it back and cock it. You've got to, you know, you crank it. So, you know, he's like, all right, I got to cock this. I'm like, all right, go for it. You know, set it down, get it lined up, clickety clackety. You know, you've got your, you got your little cord and you've got your stinking crank and you've got your little thing that hooks on the string. All of that makes noise. You hook the string, and it takes time. You hook that on the string. You get it all lined up. Okay, now i got to cock it. Clickety, 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 as he's cranking it. <laughs> it gets it all the way back. It, it sets. Okay, is it in? Now, the thing with a crossbow, it's, you've got to be careful because if you don't get it all the way back and fully engage the dry fire safety mechanism, that thing is not going to go off. It might look like it's set, but it's not set. So you've got to double check and set, okay, is that, yep, okay, it is. All right, here we go. So now it's cocked, so you, 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 in, which is safe to, to walk across the landscape with. So you walk across the landscape with it cocked. Now you get a bugler. What do you put, want to put a bolt in? Same thing. It's not as easy as just you know grabbing an arrow, pulling out your quiver, throwing it on the string and go. No, it, it's, it's just not. And so... The whole thing is much more cumbersome to use. It was heavier and more uncomfortable to carry. It's much louder. It's slower. I mean, literally, I'm sitting, there were times when, you know, we're trying to move in on our bowl, and I'm like, oh, for the love of Pete, just frick, can we just get this thing, just let's go. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm yeah. not yelling, I wasn't getting mad at my hunter because he did everything exactly what he needed to do. But if we were it's talking about an actual, yeah, it's a process. And from a, a, a compound shooter, dude, you, you stop, you grab your bow, you pick your bow, arrow out, quiver on the strength, boom, done. You are, that's, I mean, it's, it's dead quiet, and that is literally how fast. Within 10 seconds, you can be from stowage, carrying your bow in your hand, to crap, stop, stand up, arrow knocked, I'm ready. You can be ready to shoot that thing in 10 seconds and pull back and shoot dead silent. You are not doing that with a crossbow and so, so the people I that, think the, that see the huge advantage in crossbow obviously from what i hear is you can shoot almost twice as far do you agree with that or 
is that still yet to be determined? You know what? I think on paper, on a bench, yes. Yes, you have a, he's got a scope, but I watched him. He literally, and, and again, this guy's a good shot. He's, all, he's, he's hunted his entire career with archery equipment. So here is a guy that has lifelong practical experience of shooting a modern compound effectively and well to this is the year that he's using the crossbow, and even he would tell you, I can shoot much farther, much better with a compound than I can with a crossbow because now it's like shooting a rifle, and you try to shoot a rifle offhand, okay? Yeah. Shooting a rifle offhand, sure, that's fine. You can have a scope, but, but, it's, uh, but a uh, crossbow scope is not going to have, you know, it's not like you have a nine-power scope or whatever, number one. Number two, you've got these limbs, and it's, it's a lot more clunky and bulky to hold. And so even though he's, he had a little monopod that was on it to give him a you know, he'd shoot off his knees, and he had a little monopod to give him just some stability. But I watched him shoot back at camp, and, I mean, he would be seated, uh, you know, seated, elbows on his, on his knees, monopod, shooting. 60 was, 60 yards, I think, was about the, the max range that, you know, from an ethical, you know, Grouping size, 60 yards was go, was going to be about what what we probably could have done. Now, if we had been in a situation where, okay, like say we we're sitting water, and he had a chair, he had a try, you know, it had a little you know shooting sticks or whatever, and a bull stopped out there 70 or 80. Yes, he probably could have executed that shot, but that crossbow is a lot louder than a traditional compound bow. Number one, number two it's still not as stable. I mean, you sit there and you listen and you, you talk to, I mean, you, that's on social media and you hear it in, in the sporting community nowadays where people are with a traditional compound bow or modern compound bow. They're shooting elk at 70, 80, 90 yards or whatever. We can argue the ethics of that, but there's, a, I mean, shoot, people are shooting pronghorn at 120 with a, a yeah. regular compound these days. If you look at how the mechanics of a compound are with you pushing and pulling and everything, I can, I seriously, I watched it this year and I've seen it. I think most guys are going to be more accurate, more deadly with a traditional or a modern compound than even with the modern crossbows. Especially now, if we're sitting water and you're just sitting there, maybe, maybe you can argue that, okay, well, you could shoot that elk at 100 yards. Maybe, but when we're talking about running and gunning through thick cover and, and trying to be dynamic and get set, no way, no yeah. way. The crossbow doesn't even come close to being as effective and deadly as a, a modern compound. It just it's too clunky, too noisy, and heaven forbid, you know, the elk comes in and you shoot and you miss. With a compound, you just if the elk can't see you, you just read not. You just knock another arrow and you pull back and you go again and dead silent. Oh, you're done with a with a with a crossbow. <laughs> you're done. Oh, you're done. hold on, Mister Elk. Let me let me completely set my my crossbow on the ground. Let me get a bolt. Let me get the me my firing mechanism undone. Hold on, stay right there. Wait, wait. Let me get the firing <laughs> mechanism on the string. Okay, hold on. Click it, 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 click it. It ain't happening. So you're, you're, I can tell you're a huge fan of crossbows. Let's take a quick break here to hear from our sponsors. I want to thank GoHunt.com and the Gear Shop. Cody Nelson is the new optics manager, the glassing guru, optics authority. He's the new optics manager at GoHunt.com Gear Shop. If you have any optics needs, whether it be rifle scopes, binoculars, spotting scopes, tripods, what have you, you can call him at 702 Eight four seven eight seven four seven. Now he's extension two, and I've caught a lot of flack from him for giving him grief for not being extension one. And he says he's working <laughs> on trying to get to extension one. But extension two, that's seven zero two eight four seven eight seven four seven extension two. Or you can email him at optics at gohunt dot com. I'd like to thank them for their sponsorship. Make sure to give Cody a call. He's promised that he will take care of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners, and I've threatened him that if he doesn't and I hear about it, he's going to be in trouble. So 
uh, give him a call if you have any optical needs. Uh, I say that with a, with a smile on my face. Uh, but yes, he will take care of you guys. Give him a ring. I also want to thank Kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com. Uh, obviously, the, the hunting community is still in shock with the tragic passing of the founder, Jason Harrison, uh, my friend. Uh, but the crew at Kuyu is plowing ahead, and they are uh, planning to do great things this coming year. Uh, they've come out with their new Peloton line uh, uh, of, of gear, and uh, the new Kenai uh, stuff is all out, and you can go to Kuyu.com to check that out. Uh, also, CanyonCoolers.com, if you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. That's CanyonCoolers.com. If you're in the in the mood to get a new cooler, check out Canyon Coolers. So, Chris, the, the crossbow was definitely a learning experience. Um, from, you know, you talk about all the different things about a crossbow. So, you yourself, if you had a choice between a crossbow and a compound, it sounds like it would not even be uh, up for debate. And that's the thing, and, and you know. Right. The, the thing that I that really shocks me, um, and again, it, it's kind of funny. I, I mean, I, I talked to my hunter about this. You know, you look at the elk module and, and the row hunting resources stuff, and one of the big things that I always talk about when you're when you're talking about if you if you're if you are an inv- type of you know the type of person that's an investigator that wants to learn, that wants to always have the best information, that wants to you know rest as as hard on the truth as possible. You know, sometimes you, you, the best thing you can do is, is work to disprove your current beliefs. And we do that in the elk module with vocalizations and behavior and that type of stuff. Is You know, I believe something, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I, I believe a certain thing. Can I set out to change my mind? Can, it, can I find evidence that's going to change my mind? Can I disprove my previously held theory? Well, I had to laugh because this year provided me with such a, an experience that absolutely fundamentally changed my opinion on crossbows 100 and uh, crossbows in the early archery season in western hunts, okay? That, uh, let me qualify that. Right. Run, really it, run had, and gun type hunts, yeah. Yeah, it, well, the, yeah, the, like the western states that are fighting to keep crossbows out of archery season, you know, I, I was one of those people that would, would advocate to say, yes, we, we've got a different standard by, you know, harvests and, and obje- blah, blah, blah. There's, yes, I was one of those people that, that did not want crossbows in the early archery season. I always told them, put it in the muzzleloader season because it's a similar functioning type of deal, which it is. At this point, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. In my opinion, go go ahead and make it legal. Go ahead. Because the person is going to spend $1,500 or more on a, on a crossbow. They're going to go out the field, and they're going to spend one season. They're going to spend one season with it. And then they're going to go, this is a bunch of garbage. I'm going to get a bow. <laughs> I, I literally, I had one of my whitetail hunters say that. I've got a guy that, that hunts now with, out here in whitetail, and he, even he says, oh, I, I just, I need to, I just, I just need to go to. I just need to go to a compound. So, if if we want to increase, uh, and this is again, again you're going to get some controversy on this one because everybody says we're, our our you know archery seasons are too crowded anyway. But that being a se- that being aside, a separate discussion. If you want to get people into the sport of hunting and you want to get them into the sport of, of archery hunting or whatever, oh, by all means, let them use a crossbow. And, and there's people that say, well, now there's rifle hunters that are, that are moving to a crossbow. Let them. Let them. It is so flipping clunky and loud <laughs> and cumbersome. You're not going to get 10,000 new people going back country hunting with a crossbow. It ain't happening. It ain't, it ain't happening. happening. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not happening. I really do believe this. after this season, my experience, we are arguing over nothing because from a pre- from the on paper the idea of it oh yeah it, it seems more efficient it seems more deadly it seems like an unfair advantage it seems like a lot of scary things 
yeah. from a practical standpoint of running around a mountain on them? Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. Yeah, well, I think more people are way more deadly with a, with a modern compound than with a crossbow. With all that aside, um, with the feedback from the real hunting resources, um, elk module followers and what have you, um, have you know you just got back last night? Have you had a chance to digest or get any feedback from uh, guys out in the field? I know I got a couple and posted them on my Instagram account. Uh, guys saying they enjoyed the Real Hunting Resources podcast that we did and and what have you. Um, how's that going with uh, with your peeps over there? It's good. This yeah, it, it it has been. You know, we always have you know guys that'll, that'll guys and gals that'll send us a little bit of feedback, but it's like pulling teeth. It's kind of interesting. We, you know, we, you and I have talked about this before, the different, um, uh, the tribe mentality and some of the different, you know, social kind of constructs of, around some personalities and, and stuff. And the folks that tend to gravitate towards row hunting resources are not the groupy type, you know, mentality people that, you know, they don't look at me as some big celebrity who, uh, you know, that they want to follow and just, you know, I want to see what Chris Rowe is doing. Most people that, that come to the to Rowe Hunting Resources stuff are like, you know what, I just, I, I really want to learn because I want to be more deadly and I want to be more effective and I want to have a better understanding. And so they come, they learn it, they, they do well with it, and they just kind of internalize it. And so I, it's almost always pulling teeth to, hey, how did you do this year? Oh, oh, I killed a great, you know, he sends me, you know, they'll send me a picture. They just shoot their first bull with a 360 bull. I'm like, oh, my goodness. He's like, oh, my gosh, this stuff was great. Well, this year we're starting to get a lot better feedback from folks, just unsolicited. So I'm going to start posting those as well. But it's, it is. It's it's been awesome. I mean, literally, just the one I just read a moment ago was one guy out of Florida. And, I mean, he just says, you know what? I got a military, listened to some podcasts, heard you, got me fired up, got the module, got my stuff, took a drive. I met a guy, says, ah, why don't we? Why don't we just pack up? We, they literally drove to Colorado, pulled into the first Walmart, got an elk, or got an elk tag, went up the mountain, just stabbed into the dark, went into the mountain, you know, just, we're going here. Okay, walked up the mountain, let me try this, and literally went down the line of, of what I talk about, and boom, here's a bugle, boom, there's another, okay, let's go, start working it. The bull came in, the wind switched, didn't work, then the next elk just stepped through the doorway of the cow, and he's like, she's going home with me, and I mean, he made a perfect <laughs> shot and zipped her. He's like, dude, I can't even, you know, he, he's beside himself. He's like, I, so he's I live in, high. oh, yeah, he's like, I live in Florida, and I was like, eh, let's give it a try. Comes out there yeah. and has awesome success. Now, granted, there's other people that, and, and I was one of them this year, that struggle. But when you sit and you listen to them talk about it, you're like, yeah, we struggled, struggled, struggled. But the only reason why we were able to pull something out or have an experience is because of, you know, the doorway principle or, you know, understand the lost news a little bit better or assembly news or whatever. So I'm going to start posting those pictures as well and, and sharing some of the stories. But, yeah, it's been really, really good for me this year just uh, just just hearing from folks saying, man, it was a brutal tough hunt, but we still pulled it out. You know, maybe we didn't kill some, but we still had encounters. We were still able to pull it out where yeah. no one else was able to. You know, one guy was went with a with an outfitter buddy of his. He was, he was hunting with a with a guy a guy that's a professional elk outfitter. And the outfitter was like, what the hell are you doing? What? And he, he's like, dude, this stuff works. He pulled out the app. He showed the guy the app. And he's like, dude, this stuff works. And so they were sitting there going through. I was like, <laughs> that's what it's for, man. That's, you know, it's, it's not a gimmick. It's not, you know, it's not the latest gee whiz bang stuff. It, it's just solid information that if you, if you put it into action in a logical manner, I mean, it's it's what uh, it's the vocalizations elk use year round. It's the behavior they use year round. So if you put those in in play in a tough situation, it's going to work. And th and even though I was kind of you know yes, I, I might rag on Unit Nine this year and there's like, just for a variety of things, we're still able to have encounters. Still decent bulls out there running the landscape, you know, popping up here and there. You still had some good encounters. I got some really good footage. Of, I mean, some tough situations. So it still was a fun hunt. But it was a grind, and it was yeah. just a, it was a difference. You know, talking to the three different hunters that were in camp, all of them were like, "Wow, 
this is not what I thought Unit 9 was going to be. We knew it was going to be a year that was going to be down as far as antler quality, but, man, this is not the hunt that we thought it was going to be. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I always say on arid years, you know, Arizona gets reduced, you know. It, it, all, the, all the stories and the hoopla that you hear in a drought year look out because they don't bugle as well and they don't, you know, the antlers are smaller and it just seems to be overall a tough hunt, and that's what I'm hearing across the board. Well, and, and, and starting and start to, and, you, know, br- you know, brittle antlers and starting to break up. But, I mean, this yeah. is the second, but, you, but see, this is the other thing, too. And, again, I don't mean to be, you know, for people, I don't mean to be trashing on Unit 9, but people need to understand, um, this is the second year, and I did it the other day. I sat up in an area that should have just, I mean, it should be ground zero as far as where the elk are. September 27th either crackle in the morning or at night or whatever, but here it is, September 27th, cold, clear, calm. I'm up on the mountain. I'm next. I'm up in the pines. I'm next to the park. I'm in a spot where you should hear bulls just cranking crickets. That's all yeah. you heard, crickets. This is the second year in a row, the end of September. It's crickets and no bugling. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, Chris, thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Um, looking forward to following your whitetail stuff coming up. Uh, I know you're going to be fired up and give you a few days. You'll be you'll be on your game. I want to give you a chance to let people know where they can follow you, find you, and, and um, hear more about you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, just Roe Hunting Resources. It's R-O-E Hunting Resources. Instagram, as far as social media goes, Instagram's probably the best. Um, then Facebook. But I don't do a lot on Twitter. But uh, Instagram, definitely. And then if you want to learn some of the stuff that, you know, we'll see me posting some of the stuff from our hunters. But, you know, the Row Hunting Resources website, the Elk Module, that's where all the educational stuff is housed. And for those people that are subscribers, yes, um, I do get on there and answer some forum posts. I'll, I'll get on there and do some more. And, yeah, I've got some good video clips, some good educational stuff this year that, um, that's going to be more long form. You know, most of the videos, Jay, you've seen them. Now. I try to keep them somewhat clear and concise and short just so it makes it easy to watch, but there are a few times where maybe a video is uh, maybe 45 minutes long or an hour long because you want to see the entire thing unfold. Well, that's going to have – I've got several of those situations. Uh, one was my client and his bull. We did kill a, a decent bull. Uh, I got that whole thing on film. But I'm going to let that be a full-length deal because you get to see how that unfolds. And then I've got at least another one that I know that's going to be long-form uh, called a hurt bull out of his bed. Uh, I worked that bull for four, legit, four hours and finally put him at eight steps screaming in front of the camera. But the, the uh, it's probably going to be at minimum an hour-long video, if not an hour and a half, because you've got four hours of me, okay, you know, basically gaming the whole thing. He's like, all right, here's what he's doing. This is what I'm going to do. And I do it. Okay, that what this is what happened. Okay, next, you know, next. And so four hours of grinding and finally got her to, I mean, finally got in close to his bed, called him, but basically called a cow out of the bedding area. He followed and just, it worked. So there's going to be some uh, new videos on the elk module, but it, it, some of them are going to be some of these long-form videos that kind of really give people an in-depth look of, here's what I do. People ask all the time, okay, well, if you were, if you were hunting that situation, what would you do? Well, this is what I do, and this is how I do it, and this is why I do it, and this is what the results are. So for those people that are subscribers and, and want to keep following, then there's going to be some new videos here uh, getting posted. So. Awesome, buddy. Well, God bless. Thanks for spending time with us, and uh, enjoy being at home for a while, and um, get after those white tails, okay? I will do it. Be, by, uh, by all means, please, keep posting some of your own stuff <laughs> on the Odd Six Ranch so we can live vicariously through you, because I'm going through withdrawals right now. Brother. I'm going through withdrawals. <laughs> we're, we're fully bugling hard here, and um, the rut is just kicking and cranking and I'm expecting for the next couple weeks uh, all the way probably into the third week of October I'm expecting it to be pretty good Um, we're really dry here really really dry a lot of guys are saying worse than close to 100 years Um, but we've got pretty decent antler growth we've got 
bulls bugling hard, uh, chasing cows. We got uh, starting to break up, uh, starting to you know break break some antlers here, and um, but they're they're really getting after it right now. So I'll keep posting. Uh, appreciate your uh, your friendship, Chris, and um, I'll be chatting at you down the road here. Okay. All right, brother. Be safe and uh, God bless. And uh, thanks for having me on again. I enjoy talking with you. All right, buddy. Take care.